Hi, so tell me, is that gentleman trustworthy to you? No. And what about this person? No. And what do you think, or what would you think? Would you trust me if I suddenly spoke like this? I am your father. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Frauke, and I will be talking about trust. Now, you seem to know pretty well already whom or what you can trust and what not. But, you know, how do we do this? Are we, I will be talking about how this is a genuine ability all mammals share and how we, human beings, are even able to build little machines that are trustworthy. Now, why will I be talking about this? Because, together with my colleague, David Harris-Smith, I built a little robot that thousands of people found trustworthy. And not only this, they thought it was so trustworthy that they decided to offer it a ride in the cars, to take it home, to offer it a bed for the night, and even let it play with the kids. So the name was already mentioned, and I think you would have guessed by now already anyways, the little robot is Hitchbot. Hitch stands for hitchhiking, and bot for robot. Now, what do you think the main purpose of Hitchbot was? Well, I'll, I will be coming back to that later, but what you're pr probably thinking already now is that one big question that we find everywhere in our society as soon as we start talking about robots, and that's, can we trust robots? But before I start, let me introduce you properly to Hitchbot. Hello, my name is Hitchbot. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today, but I've sent someone from my family, Broca Zeller, who created me together with David Harris-Smith. Yeah, so meet Hitchbot, Canada's first robot that hitchhiked across Canada all on its own and with the help of the Canadian people. In fact, it was wholly dependent on the goodwill and help of the people because it can't drive by itself. I mean, yeah, obviously, robots can't have a driver's license, and they shouldn't, I think. Um, but it cannot move by itself either. But, you know, Hitchbot had this dream, the dream of getting to know Canada, its people, and to hitchhike from coast to coast in the summer of 2014. And even though no robot had ever done that before, it was willing to take the risk, believing in its goal. Now, Hitchbot started its journey in Halifax on July 27th and arrived safe and sound in Victoria, BC on August 21st. It got at least 17 rides by friendly humans and was invited to a First Nations powwow on Manitoulin Island where they gave it the name Woman of Steel. I really love that name. And, oh yeah, it crashed the wedding and danced mighty with the bride and groom. And it also spent quite a long time, so suspiciously long time, with a rock and roll band, you can see them here, and sometime, we believe, in a tattoo and piercing shop. And finally, it, uh, it received a grand welcome uh, in Victoria on Vancouver Island. Now, and then as an offspring of its time, this little robot, of course, is also social media savvy. So during its journey, it gained more than 35,000 followers on Twitter, more than 12,000 on Instagram, and got more than 48,000 likes on Facebook. Well, it's not as good as Justin Bieber, but I think for a little robot in three weeks, that's pretty good. So in all the social media buzz also resulted, of course, in the interest of traditional media. So Hitchbot was covered numerous times in national, but also international media. It's well known internationally all over the world by now and of course how kind Canadians are because they made all this possible at the end of the day. Now, what can we learn from Hitchbot when we talk about trust? Quite a lot. So I will be talking about two, things, two main things here now. First of all, why is trust such an important and yet difficult concept? And second of all, what does it take to build a robot that people can trust? First of all, David and I built Hitchbot because we wanted to test the people's trust level and initiate discussions about trust. And um, if you think about it, you know, you'll see our whole lives, our daily lives, they are all structured around trust. I mean, we do certain things because we trust it will work out, and we don't do things because we lack trust. And then we even use trust as a tool for education. 
So I still remember my parents asking me when they'd see me watching telly in the afternoon. I trust you finished your homework. Right? So we see even our language is full with the word trust or with references to the concept of it. And that alone is quite remarkable because trust, if you think about it, is a very abstract concept. This means it is a word that does not refer to anything tangible. So something we can all see and feel and then agree to what it is. So I think we all can agree, for example, that this is the microphone here that I'm wearing, right? Um, but we can't feel or touch or see trust. It is, as we say, an arbitrary concept. So it's a word that's ma whose meaning is made up by us, by society. And so consequently, we also define in our society and cultural context what or who is trustworthy and who is not. So David and I built Hitchbot because we wanted to see whether the people would trust Hitchbot, but also we wanted to see whether the robot could trust the people. That's why we built it in a way that was wholly dependent on their help and send it out there all on its own without us following it, knowing that something might happen, but um, you know, we were willing to take the risk. Now, why did we do this? Well, we do talk a lot more or more and more in our society about how robots will become our friends in the new future, you know, move in with us, live with us in our homes. And then we always asked, can we trust robots? And David and I thought, well, we seem to be kind of fixated on that one big question and without really making big progress in answering it. And so we thought maybe it'll help if we simply turn the question around and ask, well, can robots actually trust human beings? So, by doing this, we were hoping to gain some new insights, basically, and new ideas about people and the attitude to technology, to robots, and what role trust plays here. So, okay, to, to show this, follow me on this little thought experiment. So imagine, you all are robots now, okay? So now imagine someone comes up and invites you to their house and says you can stay for dinner, you can spend the night. You would for sure ask yourself whether that person was trustworthy or not something you know, like this. So you wouldn't ha want to have any kind of surprises like this, right? And these are the questions a robot should or would ask itself too. Now what did I just do? I simply substituted a human being with a robot. So I gave a robot the ability to think, I gave it the ability to form friends, and to make some educated judgment about people. You might think, what a strange, wacky idea, but really, this is the first step in building a trustworthy robot. And that's, just the, that's the interesting thing. We know how to build trustworthy robots, even though, as I said before, trust is such a difficult and vague concept. So, what does it take them to make something appear, or some, someone appear to be trustworthy? Well, we know that there are three main factors in human-robot interaction that help with that. First of all, the appearance and personality. Second of all, communication skills. And third of all, interaction skills. So, the appearance is really important when it comes to building a trustworthy robot. Because in human-robot interaction, which is the scientific field that deals with any aspect around robots interacting with humans, we say it is the physical embodiment that is one of the main factors to instill some kind of trust, but also make people, and that's remarkable, I think, it makes people form some kind of emotional attachment to the robot. So with physical embodiment, sometimes we also call it anthropomorphism, we know that the form and the look of a robot are essential. But it's the same case for us, for human beings, really. You know, I mean, this happens to all of us. We see someone and almost instantly, we don't want to, but we do it. Instantly, we form some kind of opinion or understanding about that person without even knowing, knowing them. And usually what is enough is to just see what, what kind of clothes the person is wearing and some physical features like height. So and the same holds true, of course, for robots. 
So we wanted to build a robot then that people wouldn't be scared of, um, that they would like, and of course that they would have to help or want to help because it can't move by itself. Um, that's why we said it shouldn't be taller than a six-year-old child and it should look fun and quirky because people tend to wanting to help when they see children because children, that's a fantastic thing, I think, in our society, children trigger a sense of innocence and trust in us. And also, when you see something that looks fun and quirky, you're certainly not scared. So, we picked, as you can see, we picked blue pool noodles for the arms and legs, and yellow rubber gloves for the hands, and also, you can, you can see it here, yellow boots. And the torso really is nothing but a big bucket, a beer cooler. Um, and also, what you want to do in order to instill trust, you need to have give the machine some kind of a face. And in our case, it was important to have a smiley face, as you can see here. And then also, we wanted to give it a nice and fun personality, because we wanted, to people, wanted people to enjoy being with Hitchbot. I mean, surely you, you wouldn't want to go on a car drive with someone that was terribly dull, right? So how do we do that? Well, you have to come up with a whole life story for this little robot. That means you have to come up with where it was born, who its family is, what its hobbies are. Like, for instance, Hitchbot loves horse riding and European football and hockey, of course. And um, this also makes the robot more trustworthy. And the reason for this is human beings just function that way. When we see something that has the same characteristics, that resembles us, we have more trust. And this is something we all share, right? We all have a family, we all have a history. So these are common features that we can use. And we made sure to communicate this, which brings me to the second main factor in building a trustworthy robot, communication skills. Now, communication skills usually go hand in hand with the third factor, interaction skills. So what you want to do if you want to build a trustworthy, sociable robot, you want to ask yourself in the beginning, so how is the robot supposed to communicate and interact with the people and its environment? Now, the good news is, as soon as you build a robot that doesn't look scary, there's this interesting thing about human beings that I've watched many times. People tend to be really intrigued when they see a robot, especially a friendly robot. So they come closer and they want to understand how they can interact with it. So basically, half of the work is already done, right? And the first question they ask usually is, can you talk? That's a very natural instinct of us, apparently. And since we thought or we wanted the robot to travel with people across Canada, we said, of course, it should be able to talk. But here comes the question. What do you talk about with a stranger robot? Any idea? How do you feel? Where are you from? Very good. Absolutely. So, thank you. I mean, we first, really, we asked us the question, what, no, what should, what should Hitchbot talk about, right? Should it be a sophisticated scientist or, you know, a quirky little, little person? So, but for sure, if you meet a stranger, you don't ask any personal questions, right? Like, what's your bank account number? You ask general questions like, where are you from? Um, where are you going? What's your name? So what we did, we programmed, and that's what we call in artificial intelligence, dialogue models. We basically sat down and wrote f scripts, like film scripts, for Hitchbot. So we thought about what, what, what would people want to ask Hitchbot and talk about, and then what would Hitchbot answer. And that took quite a long time was very difficult, but one example is when someone comes up to Hitchbot and, and asks, who are you? Hitchbot says, I am Hitchbot, I'm from Port Credit, Ontario, and I want to hitchhike across Canada, can you give me a lift? So, and the people really seemed to like that, um, and they didn't mind that the fact that Hitchbot sometimes really, to be honest, quite often wouldn't give the exact or the right answer to the question. But that's a different story. So, what do we then, what do we learn from all this? And coming back to my earlier question, what was the main purpose of Hitchbot? 
Well, you know, I used to work quite a lot in more traditional experimental setups um, with many robots and human-robot interaction. And what we usually do there is we make sure that we have everything under control. So we have a controlled environment, which means a lab space. We pick very carefully the participants and we make sure we watch the interaction every single second. So, for instance, we can step in when something happens, right? And there's a problem. But with Hitchbot, obviously, we had nothing under control, which would drive me crazy in the beginning, really. I thought this can never work. So, we didn't know who would participate because we just sent it out there. We didn't follow Hitchbot, right? So, we couldn't have a say in who would take it with it. Um, we, didn't, um, we couldn't help if something would happen if someone had a problem with Hitchbot and wouldn't know how to handle Hitchbot. At the same time, we, we knew that some, if someone, you know, maybe some angry person wanted to hurt Hitchbot, we couldn't do anything and prevent that. And still, it worked out just fine. It was, in fact, it was a big success. Everybody was so helpful. And I think this shows that we need a lot more of those open field experiments. See, if we want to build robots that become our friends, if we're really serious about, this, serious about this idea, robots becoming our friends, moving in, flatmates, whatever, right? Living with us. We need to ask first, what do the people want? They should decide what kind of machines and technology will be living with them. And they should decide what they're going to do or what the technology can do, not the other way around. In research, we call this social construction of technology, in short, SCOT. So only then we can make sure that the interaction works out and it's a success. And I think industry and university research should really keep this in mind. Plus, we could also see with Hitchbot, which was really interesting, and that really blew my mind, to be honest, was that it didn't just appear to be trustworthy, it also inspired people. You have no idea, they were so creative with all the ideas they came up with in terms of how to interact. Or have you ever seen a robot on a camper toilet? I mean, this is surely was the first time for me to see that. So inspiring creativity, that is a very important aspect if we design more openly robots and technology to interact with. And in short, to sum up, we can say, if we want to learn more about trust and how to build trust, of humans and robots, we need to listen to the people first. We also need to be more open to new perspectives and new approaches to our attitude to technology and what we want to do with it, right? And one person who gave Hitchbot a ride said, you know, the communication didn't always work out that well, but that didn't matter. In fact, Hitchbot brought me closer to other people. Because wherever you show up with Hitchbot, all people, people come up and want to talk to you. And I think this means that Hitchbot wasn't only trustworthy, but it also built trust to bring us closer to each other. And I think this is a wonderful thing that, can, that, that technology can do. I mean, imagine, technology can bring us closer to each other and build trust in each other. That is an amazing feature that we usually overlook when we talk about technology these days. And I think we should keep this in mind whenever we design and plan smart, intelligent technologies. Thank you.